Hey, what's up guys? Coach Mac, playfastfootball.blogspot.com. Today we're going to take a look at uh, develop, developing a defense, and we're going to look at some of the things that you need to um, understand how to develop a defense and develop a defense for you and develop a defense for your school and the program that you're at. You know, a lot of the videos that, that I've done in the past and a lot of the questions that I get are always about scheme. How do you defend this? How do you play that? How do you play this coverage? Or how do you run this blitz or pressure? Or what line stunts do you use? And as much as I love schematics, as much as I love schemes, one of the things that got me into coaching and one of the things that keeps me in coaching is I love the mental chess game. I love X's and O's. I love the you know adjustments that have to be made throughout the course of a game. But at the end of the day, after doing this for 20 years and doing it in every capacity possible, one win seasons, two win seasons, nine win seasons, eight win seasons, three rounds deep in the playoffs, not making the playoffs. I've been through the, the gauntlet of everything you can possibly go through. Um, I've been through tough seasons where you've had to endure uh, difficult situations. I've been through seasons where you've had to endure player suspensions. I've been through seasons where we've had fights on the field. Um, I've been through about everything in a 20-year career, and after all that, what you, what you get a chance to do sometimes, if you really love your job and what you do, you get a chance to kind of reflect and figure out where you are, where you're coaching, and what you need to do to help your kids and your program be successful. So this past season, we've had uh, an extremely difficult season. We've gone through a lot of adversity. Um, and defensively, we've played very, very poorly. And I've had a chance to look back at the nine games that we played and had a chance to kind of look back at why we've played poorly. And what I'd like to do today is kind of go through some things that are less schematics involved and start figuring out what you need to do to understand how to develop your defense. All right, so first thing I'm going to talk about is the four things that no matter what scheme you play, doesn't matter if you're odd, even, Man, zone, split field, middle of the field, close, post safety. Doesn't matter what coverages you play. Doesn't matter if you're pattern match, spot drop. Doesn't matter what you do. These four things will get you killed every single time. And it's the four things that have gotten us killed this year. And when I look around our area at the schools that play good defense, there's two recurring themes. One, they have very good players. Two, they do these four things phenomenally well, exponentially well, better than everybody else. All right, so the first one is assignment alignment. All right, do your players know their assignment, and do they know how to align to execute that assignment? Okay, first thing that will get you beat on defense, not being lined up properly, not understanding how to get aligned to do your job, not being able to set an edge of a defense, not being able to understand up front what your shades or your gaps are, not being able to play your gap because you're not lined up right. Linebackers not being able to fit where they belong because they're not lined up right. Okay, And then the assignment. What are you trying to play? Is it base? Are you moving? Are you blitzing? Are you zone blitzing? Are you man blitzing? Do you have a man that you need to play? Do you need to fit a run based off a man in the backfield? Are you playing a zone concept where you have to maybe pattern match off certain releases? Are you playing a spot drop concept where you need to get to a curl flat hook curl? Are you playing a deep middle of the field? Are you playing a deep third where maybe you've got a midpoint receivers? All those things being able to understand when you get the call, okay, what is your assignment? What are you trying to execute on that particular play? All right, those are things with assignment alignment you got to understand. It has nothing to do with the schematics of what you're doing, okay? The assignment will have a little bit to do with your scheme. But the bottom line is on every play, no matter what you do, every player has an assignment. They have an alignment to execute that assignment. All right, number two, block recognition, block reaction. This one is, to me, about the most prevalent of all the things I see in defense. Do your guys know what to look at? Do they know where they're looking? And do they know what the reaction is based off what they get when they look in the right place? All right. Do you know how to play down blocks? Do you know how to play base blocks? Do you know how to play reach blocks? Do you know how to play pass sets? All right. Do you know how to react when you get those blocks? Do you know what we're doing on defense to react? Do you know whether you're a spill player or a box player? 
Do you know whether you're trying to send the ball back to another inside linebacker or if you're trying to send it out to uh, a safety or another free hitter? Do you know where you're sending the ball? All right. Block reaction, block recognition are the two big keys. Your guys have to understand what they're looking at. They have to understand where to look, and they need to know what to do once they see what they're looking at. All right. So block recognition and then the reaction off the stimulus of the recognition that you get are two paramount things that you've got to work over and over and over again and when I watch our film and I watch us play that's the one of the biggest issues all the time we don't react to the blocks that we see or we don't see the blocks we need to see to get the proper reaction if you're supposed to play a down block a certain way and you don't see the down block because you're looking in the backfield, you're never going to play the, blo the down block the way you're supposed to play it because you don't even see it. If you're supposed to play a reach block a certain way and you're looking in the backfield, you'll get reached before you even get out of your stance because you don't even see that the lineman is working to reach because you're looking in the wrong spot. All right, so if you don't understand block recognition, block reaction, you're never going to play good defense. Okay, block destruction. Depending on the types of teams you're playing, offenses are always going to try and get a hat on a hat. It doesn't matter if they're spread and they're going to do it by spreading you out and getting numbers in the box. It doesn't matter if they're 21 personnel and they're going to do it with a tight end and a fullback. They're going to try and get a hat on a hat. Good defenses always try to get at least plus one in the run game. So you're always trying to get a free hitter and you're trying to get the ball sent to that free hitter. That's all well and good. Bottom line is guys are going to get blocked. How do they play off of those blocks? Can you have players that can defeat blocks and make plays? That will be the most pivotal, one of the most pivotal things, along with obviously the four that I've got up here. But block destruction is always going to play a big part in what you're doing because offenses are good enough nowadays to formation you into situations where they get hats on hats. All right, and as much as you want to get an extra fitter, an extra hitter, you may not get one free all the time based on on the formation and what the offense is doing. Nowadays with RPOs and all the quarterback read game and quarterback runs, it's very tough to get plus one in the run game. So what it's going to come down to is when they have a hat on a hat, are their six better than your six? Can your six get off the blocks of their six? If they're tight end, fullback, 21 personnel, are your eight as good as their seven or eight? All right, or are your seven as good as their seven to get the ball sent to your eighth player? All right, at a certain point, Guys in football are going to be blocked. You're going to get blocked on kickoff. You're going to get blocked on punt coverage. You're going to be blocked. Can you defeat a block? Can you defeat a block with proper leverage? And can you go make a play? All right, to me, that, that's going to be something that is pivotal, something that we've tried to work on. Uh, you saw some other videos I've done with, with stuff that we did on a two-man sled. It's something that we've gotten better at, but we're still not great at, and that's one of the reasons we don't play great defense. Sooner or later, in every call, you like to think that you can make calls to get free hitters, but at the end of the day, there's going to be calls where they have six, you have six. One of your guys has to be able to de destruct, destroy a block and make a play. All right, that's football. That's the nature of the game. All right, you can only scheme and, and blitz and get coverage where it's quarters coverage or robber coverage or getting extra safeties in a run versus 21 personnel. You can only do that so much to where there's going to be a point where a play gets run and it's your guys against their guys and can you get off and defeat blocks? Are you violent enough with your hands? Do you know where to shoot your hands? Do you know what leverage you're playing when you defeat that block? All right. Um, you know, we had a situation last night that happened to us where we had a bunch of guys that, that were uh, suspended from a week before with an incident that happened on the field and we had some backups get in the game and we couldn't play all the things that we wanted to play so we ended up trying to play a bunch of 3D. And we played a team that spreads the field, their tempo. So they were running sets where they had receivers stacked, and they would go three by one, and they would stack the number three receiver behind the number two receiver. And we had our three deep player out there head up so that if they threw the stand-up screen, we needed to beat that block outside in, turn that stand-up screen back into where we had the rest of our help because if the ball got to the perimeter in a three deep structure, they had a receiver to block the corner. We didn't want the ball getting out there. First three drives we lined up, our safety lined up inside of that set, got blocked inside, and they threw the stand-up screen four times for 100 yards. Okay? Not assignment, not alignment, don't understand block reaction, and can't beat the block. When we got blocked, we got blocked inside. We didn't beat the block. We didn't get off the block. We had the wrong leverage with the defense that we were trying to play. 
So those three things right there will get you killed every day of the week. All right, so you've got to be able to understand how to focus on those things. And then the last one is always going to be tackling. Okay, if you look back at any bad season on defense, you look back at any bad game on defense, at any level, it's going to come down to tackling. Can you get people on the ground? I don't care how you do it. All right, obviously with the safety in the game now, everybody's going to heads up tackling, working on, you know, uh, working on how to keep your head behind the ball and, and, and rugby tackle, working on near foot, near shoulder, all right, working on swoop, shimmy, all the, the terminology that you want to use to get people in position to make a play. Bottom line is you have guys that can get their guys on the ground. All right. The safer you can do it for the game is obviously in the best interest of everybody involved. But at the end of the day, can you get a guy on the ground? Can you get him on the ground by holding his ankle? Can you get him on the ground by grabbing his jersey? Can you get him on the ground by rugby tackling? Can you get him on the ground by running your chest straight through his chest? However you do it, can you get that guy on the ground? All right. Can you hold him up long enough for help? Can you force him back to where he needs to go so that if you don't make the tackle, somebody else can? Tackling will always be the number one deal. And the hardest thing about tackling is how do you coach it, teach it, and how do you work it in practice if you get into situations. Tackling has to be done in some type of live set. You can do every drill you want to do. It has to be done in, in some type of live, in live set. All right, That's going to be the first issue. The second issue is how can you do it in a live setting when you don't have 85 scholarships and 110 players on your roster and the guy that's behind your starter is dramatically different than the starter and the guy that's behind him is dramatically different than him. So if you get somebody hurt in a tackling circuit, the next guy you put on the field all right, is worlds removed from the starter and the guy behind him is worlds removed behind him. So how can you be physical and preach that physicality to tackle every day knowing that if you lose one of those players, you don't even have a chance to win because you don't have adequate backups? That's always going to be a battle for everybody. That's always going to be something that um, you have to look at, think about in your practice, but you've got to be able to tackle. You've got to be able to teach whatever it is you think you need to teach and do the drills you need to do to tackle, but you've got to be able to get guys on the ground. All right, We've had situations where we played poorly on defense this year, and in every game we've had opportunities to make plays, get guys on the ground. If, if you're not very good on defense and the other team is better than you, if you get a scenario where you make a play in the backfield, and you can get them off schedule and behind the chains, and you got a chance to tackle somebody for a five-yard loss, and you miss that tackle, and two more guys miss a tackle, and it becomes a two-yard game, second and eight and second and 15 are two different worlds for offenses and offensive coordinator. Okay? If you play a team that likes to run the ball, and you get them in second and eight, they run it again to make it third and four or third and three. They're comfortable. You get them in second and 15, they run it again to third and nine, now they're not comfortable. So it's a world of difference so that when you get guys in a position to make plays, if they don't get people on the ground, all right, that is what's going to eventually kill you because you're trying to disrupt the other team, get them off schedule, get them behind the chains. Now, here's another issue that you're always going to be faced with. If you don't have the speed that the other team has, you can't replicate that in a tackling drill. If the other team has 225-pound backs and you don't, you can't replicate that in a tackling drill. That's one of the reasons you see in college – when you saw Nick Saban and some of these guys starting to go to where they bring back former players to give a look. If you're going to play Lamar Jackson and you don't have a Lamar Jackson on your roster, you can do everything you want in practice to simulate that. You can't simulate Lamar Jackson. All right? If you're going to play a big physical tailback, you don't have a big physical tailback on your roster, you can't simulate that in practice. There's no way to simulate 225 pounds straight downhill and get a kid to tackle it if you don't have 225 pounds that can do that on your team. So simulating the other team's speed, the other team's efficiency, and the other team's run game is always going to be tough in tackling drills. All right? It's going to be very similar in block reaction, block destruction. If you're going to play guys that are 300 pounds up front, that base block from a 300 pounder looks a lot different than a base block from a 180 pounder. Okay? So it's always going to be tough to emulate and simulate some of those things in practice, but you've got to do what you feel is best to get your kids prepared. So if you don't have a 220-pound tailback, you've got to put at least somebody that runs the ball hard at kids in tackling drills so they can tackle somebody with a mentality of running the ball hard, physical, downhill. That's the only way you're going to have a chance to simulate that. All right. So those four things, in my opinion, are going to be what always gets you in a situation where you're playing bad football. Don't worry about palms, mix, special, read, hawk, sky, cloud, 
over, under, bear, double eagle, oaky, stack. Don't worry about any of those things. If you can't do those four things, you can't play defense. Okay? The other things are great to talk about. The offseason is one of the, my most favorite times of the year because it becomes more schematically involved and you can talk schematically with people. I'm scheduled to do two chalk wars at a glacier clinic, which is basically whiteboard, you against somebody else. Those things are great, but at the end of the day, those chalk wars really mean nothing. It's, it's about dude wars. It's about X and O on the field, Jim and Joe wars, all right? So you got to do these four things regardless of your talent level, regardless of the types of kids you have, you got to do these four things. All right, with that being said, now how are you going to develop it? Okay. First thing I think you got to look at, okay. What's the school makeup? What kind of school you're at? Are you at a school with high academics? Do you have kids that can function in an academic setting where they can think, they can make choices, all right? They can make good choices, they can problem solve, all right? Or are you at a place that is a little bit lower functioning in the academic setting so that when the kids get in situations where they have to make choices and they have to make decisions, they don't make decisions very quickly. They make a lot of bad decisions, all right? And you don't want to put them in positions where they have to think a lot because they don't have those cognitive skills to be problem solvers, all right? The makeup of your school and the clientele that you have is going to be very important. Even in the days today in the state of Florida with open enrollment, when guys can go out and get the players that they want in, the makeup of your school, you can only get so many of those players in. Eventually, the rest of your roster is probably going to be made up of kids at your school. You better understand the makeup of your school and what you're trying to do with those kids and are you doing what's best for those kids and, and how they can perform. All right, number two. All right, what's the makeup of the staff? Who do you have on your staff? How much football knowledge do those guys have on your staff? All right. Do you have guys that can teach certain fundamentals, or do you have guys that have to get tunnel vision into, hey, these are the three things you got to work on, work on them every day? Do you have guys that are great in-game adjusters, or do you have guys that just have to be, you know, position coaches in Indy every day and they don't give you much value on Friday night? You have to know what your staff is, and every staff is different, and it's getting tougher and tougher with teaching jobs nowadays to get – staffs that are solid from top to bottom, all right? And to get guys that are great teachers of the game on the field, they're great teachers of the game in film, they understand how to get their kids to perform at a high level, they understand how to make certain adjustments in game, all right? So your staff makeup, <coughs> excuse me, is just as important as your school makeup, all right? Well, what do those guys bring to the table? What do they know? What can they do, okay? All right. What's the football IQ in your program? Okay. What's the football IQ in your program? Do you come? Are you at a program where people know a lot about the game of football? Do your kids know a lot about the game of football? We had an incident three weeks ago where a team sky kicked on us and our kick returner didn't feel the ball. The ball bounced dead where it was, the other team fielded. Returner came to the side and said, Coach, I never touched that ball. And I said, well, kickoffs are live. We've been working on this for eight weeks. We've been working on kickoffs being live after 10 yards. He said, Coach, I didn't know that. Well, that's my fault then. Okay, as... Elementary as that sounds, and you can blame a kid all you want to, that's my fault at the end of the day if he didn't know that. We thought we stressed it with all these sky kicks and pooch kicks. We thought we stressed why they were doing them and what their, their goal was. But at the end of the day, the kid didn't know that. He comes off the field. He costs us a possession. They score on the first play of the game when we're supposed to have the football. It, it's not a good situation. So what's your football IQ? What's your football IQ of your staff? Do you have guys that know a lot about the game, or do you have guys that have coached at lower levels and they only know certain things? Do you have guys that study all year round and go to clinics, or do you have guys that kind of watch a few college games and think that you can run whatever the college run? All right? Every staff is different, and as a head coach, you have to find out, one, how to make your staff better, and two, what can your staff handle? Once you figure those things out, it's your job to put all the puzzle pieces in place. All right? So school makeup, staff makeup, football IQ is huge. If you're at one of those places where they run everything the same from the time they're 6 to the time they're 16, and you have all these feeders and all these systems that are built that way, God bless you, that's a great way to do it. If you're at a place like, like I'm at and places I've been at other than one job that I had for two years, the other 17 years of coaching for me, I get kids from various backgrounds. I get kids that have never played ball to kids that have played Pop Warner ball at two different places. I don't get a group of kids that come up playing the same thing over and over and over again. So when they get to us, the football IQ is drastically low. So with that understanding, 
how do you raise that football IQ? But while you're trying to raise that football IQ, how can you do things that at least they can understand and don't put them in a bad position? All right. All right. And then number four, the key is. All right. How are you going to win? What are you going to do to win? All right. It's not about what you know. It's never going to be about you know. It's not about what your sometimes your overall philosophy. Yeah, everybody talks about having a philosophy, have a mission statement, have goals. Okay, the greatest thing I've ever heard is mission statements are meaningless unless you have people that can get the mission done. Everybody can have a mission statement, but if you don't have people to get the mission done, it doesn't matter what your mission statement is. All right? So, how are you going to win? You want to be a certain team. You go out and study the game of football, and you want to play pattern match. You want to play pattern read. You want to play odd front. You want to play reduction. You want to play double eagle. You want to play over or even stuff. You want to do all those things. Is it going to help your team win? If it's not going to help your team win, then put your ego aside and don't worry about what you want to do and do the things that your kids can do to win. Do the things that your staff can do to win. All right, so when you look at all these things, school makeup, staff makeup, football IQ, how do you win? Take all those and look at them. Who's at your school? Who's on your staff? What's their football knowledge? What can we get them to do to win? Because when Fridays come, the one thing that's going to get you killed on defense all the time is slow all right, hesitant football. All right, so if you're doing things that your kids are slow and hesitant about, you're never going to win. You've got to do things that are fast and reactive that your kids can do without thinking. If those things become more man-to-man, -man, well, then hell, play more man-to-man. -man, all right, and understand that you're going to give up more plays and more chunk plays and more big plays because you're playing man-to-man. -man. But also understand that you may put your kids in a situation to make get more explosive plays on defense, more tackles for losses and more three and outs because you you get a team off schedule because you make plays in the backfield. Understand your identity and know how to live to that identity. That's going to be the biggest thing of all. All right, so when we talk today about developing a defense, no X's and O's, no schemes. We're not talking about any of those things. All right, we're talking about assignments, alignments, block recognition, block reaction, block destruction, tackling. How do you build your team? Who's in your school? Who's on your staff? What's the IQ? How are you going to win games? That's what it comes down to. All right, so as you get into the offseason, there's going to be a lot of great things out there. You're going to want to study. You're going to look at schemes clinics, lots of great stuff going on. Figure out who you are, figure out where you are, figure out how you need to win, do what you need to win, put your ego aside, and don't worry about everything else. All right, at the end of the day, guys, as always, if you, don't, you don't play well until you play fast, and especially on defense, all right, slow, hesitant defense will get you killed. Play fast, play hard, all right, and have the kids think least amount as possible. All right, as always, I'll see you next time.